We have um, a one-woman industry coming up to meet you now. A novelist, a filmmaker, and a teacher, and one of the most creative and prolific people I have ever met. She conquered the UK a long time ago when she came to the UK on a study visa from China. She's since started taking over the whole of the rest of Europe, um, Germany and Switzerland. Um, she's the Friedrich Dürrenmatt Guest Professor in World Literature at the University of Bern. She is a Jalou Guo. So, Jalou. It's amazing what you've, I didn't even, I knew that you had a German connection, I knew you had various other European connections, but it wasn't until one of my colleagues told me, oh yes, and she's had a, a residency in Zurich, um, um, you were writer in residence in Zurich, and then this guest professorship in, in Bern, so you know the Swiss really well. Well, I think very superficial, really. <laughs> what are they like? What are they like? What? I mean, it's funny because for Chinese, okay, it, it's, if I'm being rude, Switzerland just like Britain, although there's no common... <laughs> but, then, but then I thought when I came to Britain 15 years ago, of course it was a cultural shock for Chinese, never left China. Then I left Britain, went to live in Germany, and then went to live in France, and eventually ended up in, in Switzerland for a few writer residents. And this year, again, I'm teaching in Bern. Um, I guess the landscape for me is the first thing I try to understand, not the culture. Because I think landscape kind of, you know, there's more democratic relationship to my body. But the culture is always very opaque for me to penetrate. Now you're um, in this country, I mean, I won't go over all the things that you've done. I mean, you are so productive and so prolific, and you're, you're known, if you like, to give you a label as a, an avant-garde filmmaker and, and, and writer. But do, how, when you're in Switzerland, how avant-garde um, do you think Switzerland is? Oh, you see, the question's already self-answered. Um, <laughs> I guess because I grew up in a very noisy, dirty, active Chinese village, so in the beginning, of course, you know, I'm not supposed to be you know, saying negative things. You know, first, it's a very boring country. And I said, no, 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 you can write in your literature. You're not supposed to speak like this. And I said, yeah, sorry, very peaceful. Um, <laughs> and I think because I think also my experience in Switzerland is artificial. You know, you guys got out. And I think my experience, it I'm... Sounds like escaping from <laughs> prison. <laughs> and I think it's like opposite because I came from this large country with crazy, dirty ambitions to conquer the world, and everywhere is polluted, you know, every human life is sacrificed, damaged, ruined by our political ambition and the economical ambition of China. Then I went to a country which is so modest, so self-effacing, and with its very modest pride. The pride is invisible, unlike the Chinese and American pride, which is completely visible. And I think I really try to adjust. And also, I guess it's like self-denying of my own existence, which has been quite loud, noisy, you know, combating and a fighter's life. So in Switzerland, I found myself dis disabled a bit, um, paralyzed a bit. And also, sometimes I'm ashamed of my own ambition in Switzerland because the writers are very, you know, interior. Because the Chinese writers are automatic, we are political, we are engaged, we, you know, it could be, you could be president or mayor, you know, you write poems, you know, like Mao Zedong, you know, the great Mao, he writes poems in the night and bombs some province in the day, you know. So, <laughs> it was like, but in Switzerland, you, you cannot, you know, you can't claim things like that. And so, it's all politically incorrect if I use my original vocabulary. And I think this is something similar of my experience living in Britain. I had to acquire another set of vocabulary in English right now with my second language in order to speak sensibly to you. And I found myself doing the same thing in Switzerland. So do you speak any of these, in, any of the Swiss language? I mean, you spent time in Germany and Ambition in France. German, do you, do but my French is a bit better. Is it? Right. So you, but you teach Nothing in English. Like you. <laughs> you teach in English. Yeah, yeah I will be in the, in the world literature, which is more like post-colonial literature department, mm. or literature department. So, in, although my, my 
you know, I come from really Chinese literature background, but really European composition, which I studied in the mm. university. I mean, it's, what's interesting for me, sort of looking at Swiss literature, say, over the last decade or so, is that uh, there have been so many other nations coming into Switzerland, and, uh, you know, a lot, a lot of immigrants have come in. And I know that your family originally, you know, your mother came from Greece, but there have been so many Romanians and lots of different people writing Swiss literature now. So this idea of Switzerland being sort of narrow and uh, insular and so on, is this not true anymore? I think, you know, for me, actually, on one hand, I found Switzerland's the most open, open land, even though the mountain are, you know, kind of automatic, become the barrier of different culture and, and kind of separated because of political and linguistic identity. But for me, it has been a very open place. I guess, you know, my experience, at, again, was quite spoiled, you know, artificial experience because I was invited as a writer residence, as a professor there. Now, my experience in Britain is extremely harsh. The first 10 years was... You were happy. Yeah, it was poor immigrant was treated quite badly, you know, with everything. And so that's, again, it's unfair to compare my life in Switzerland as so much better, which fits the cliche of the living quality of Switzerland. But now, after all these years, I think I have better judgment. But what you, what you do, it seems to me, with everything you do, is you always look at language and identity in whatever you're doing. And a country like Switzerland, which has quite a complex identity and language set up, will be a fascinating, um, ex fascinating feature to examine and investigate. Yeah, because in the, in the beginning I was a official judge of a place, I thought maybe it's going to be boring, I stay in Zurich for a year. But I found that actually much more inspiring, although I mean, I wrote my the recent book memoir entirely in, in, within that six months in Zurich. And also I had the same experience in Berlin, which I stayed. I found it actually much more inspiring, although I was using English to write all my books. But it's strange, I, I didn't get so much inspiration in these countries with the supposed language. So I probably it's kind of, it's like the, the cross infection, you know, it's, it's the body being so attacked by different linguistic identity and the cultural identity. So I was under attack by alienness around me. So I often found myself in alien land writing actually better stuff. You know, it's, it's strange. Yeah. Now, um, you and I have something, um, a great love in common. Um, we love Heidi. Um, not just that. In my case, I only read Heidi two years ago when, you only read I, when I was 42. Perhaps in your case. <laughs> but that's, isn't that um, amazing? I mean, what is it about Heidi that. I mean, I can tell you what, no, what I'm not going to mean, mythologize any fairy no. tale. I know there's philosopher here. You know, <laughs> I have no real, you know, worship for any fairy tale because I grew up in communist China in the 70s. We never have this Western type of fairy tales. And the queens, the princess, we killed them all. <laughs> So I, I stay with my position. I have no fascination yet. Uh, well, four years ago, five years ago, I had a baby, so I had to study myself, pick a book to read for my little baby. Um, and I still refuse. You know, every book is about some little beautiful girl, you know, stereotype or little princess would be. And I hate it. So, but we grew up purely reading Russian, you know, like I was seven or eight, where in where we doctorated by you know Russian Soviet, you know, big bomber fighter, you know, all the heroes. And I still I have some kind of you know sentimental value on, on that silly stuff. So <laughs> So when you ask what I'm gonna read, and I yeah. thought that's the only thing I wrote. Um, you know, I was forty two years old woman. My child was only two years old, and I had this writer residence in Zurich, and I had to study what's the easiest book to read about Switzerland, the little Heidi. And I said, what's about? And everyone said, you never heard of Heidi? I said, oh, how would I? Have you heard of Leifeng? Have you heard of Lu Xin? <laughs> and they said, who are they? I said, that's our children book. And they, you said, well, I said, well, you know nothing of my culture. Why should I know? So I have this hostile enemyship to the culture who has no idea of my culture. Yeah? So I'm kind of claiming my identity from the foreign alienness too. So it's kind of my self-protection from, you know, from the ignorance, basically. But Heidi, now you're going to read a little bit. Um, you've, yeah. you've got an essay, which So is this is a little thing I, I wrote for this uh, Swiss magazine, Vice Versa. Um, and at that year, they were, I think, I think last year, there's an anniversary of Heidi. So I was like panicking, what is Heidi? I don't know. You know so, <laughs> Um, 
<laughs> but still, I, I, I say that because I don't want to mythologize any fairy tale. You know, of course, I love Green Brother, all that stuff. But again, I think it's just one story. Every story is one story in you know, a relationship between human or, or the human power as a nature or between different humans, but it's all about power you know, beyond nature and within nature. So, okay, this little bit I will read. It's only the last section okay. from that essay. Okay. And it's called The Yin and Yang yeah, of Heidi. Yeah, it's called The Yin and the Yang of Heidi. Um, <laughs> So the, the, the first part is much better, but I'm only going to read the last part, okay? <laughs> but after this, you're going to read some Chinese fairy tales you would feel you want to we be a promise, hero. Okay. We promise, promise. Yeah, we promise. It's very dark. Um, the little old town of Manfield is charmingly situated from it. A footpath leads through green, well-wooded stretch to the foot of the heights which look down imposingly upon the green valley. So I was reading Heidi to my two-year-old while I lived in Switzerland. I was a writer residence for Zurich Literature House. I took my little child to the famous mountains to see those crazy cows <laughs> and the big flowers. But I also realized that we are no longer living in Heidi's time the modern-day Heidi would be sent to a school in a big city and probably studying Chinese as her second language. <laughs> it's really incredible to think that only 150 years ago, most people were still living in rural nature and undertaking real travel with their own feet or carts. Since the invention of a commercial air flight in the US in 1914, the world has changed radically, and now we are on a totally different planet, fast, urbanized, technical, and global. A year had passed in silence. The day before we left Switzerland, I climbed the Alps with my friends. At one point, I found myself breathing heavily, standing in the deep snow on a 3,000-meter 3, 3, high mountaintop. We were on Titulus, near Angonberg, the heart of Alps, with a panoramic view beneath us. The scenery was almost too spiritual for a Chinese woman like me, who had grown up in the muddy and hot rice paddies, swamped by mosquitoes and human activities. I gazed down to the unspoiled slope under some cliffs and wondering if I could survive on a Swiss mountain, cutting off all connections with the culture I grew up with. Then I heard a string of camera clicking sounds. I turned around in the thin air and discovering that I was surrounded by armies of Chinese tourists. <laughs> but none of them had climbed the mountain with their own feet. They had only taken the sky lift, and some of them even wore, wore flip-flop slippers. <laughs> and they stood on the top for an average eight to nine minutes, just enough time to take five photos. Then they collectively disappeared down the hill via sky lift again. And I presumed that their Chinese lunch was ready in the local Chinese restaurant named Moonrise in Angleburg, which I had also visited yesterday. <laughs> and seeing my Chinese natives leave the mountain for their pork noodle lunch, I lost my intention to have a spiritual conversation with solemn nature and the silent snow. I was very keen to get back to the earth too. On the way down to the village, the sentences from Heidi began to ring in my ears. They started merrily up the Alp. A cloudless, deep blue sky looked down on them, for the wind had driven away every little cloud in the night. The fresh green mountainside was bathed in brilliant sunlight, and the many blue and yellow flowers had opened. Heidi was wild with joy. As we descended, I wondered, do we ever spend enough time looking at what lies around us 
on our planet? Don't we owe a big debt to nature? It seems to me that our modern life has driven us further and further away from the source of everything. Where the consumers only consume nature, and the nature doesn't need us and doesn't want us. There will be no more Heidi's in this world to appreciate the contours of nature with wild joy. Thanks. <laughs>